around the time that Hawking made his discovery that black holes evaporate, you were working on the same problem, basically. And so I'm, I'm wondering what, what led you to, what made you start working on that? So it wasn't the same problem, but it, I mean, it turned out to be closely related. So Steve Fulling had, in his thesis, asked the question and, and wasn't really able to answer it. He said, look, we've got these two coordinate systems in flat space-time. We've got the Rindler coordinates and we've got Minkowski coordinates. And we do the usual quantization, you know, e to the minus i omega t modes, they're universal modes that go like that. Um, uh, is the quantization that you get in the Rindler quantization the same as the quantization as you get in the in the uh, Minkowski one? And I got as I, I'd gone to Ber um, Birkbeck College already by that time to work with Roger, and he sent me his thesis. And in addition, um, Jim Hartle had written a, a paper for the Wheeler Festschrift. 60th birthday fast shift, I think, in which he argued that if you had an electron just outside the horizon of a black, that you know, the bifurcate horizon of a black, of an eternal black hole, and another electron inside, that they wouldn't be able to see each other via the weak force because you had, you know, this was basically using the Rindler quantization, the Schwarzschild time quantization. You know, the, they're uncorrelated with each other, so and there's no way in which this guy can send a signal to that one. Which just didn't seem. So it was those two things together that really got me thinking. And when I became, I then went to Berkeley as a Miller Fellow. Um, I'd gone to Roger for two years. I got it in a two-year fellowship from the NRC in Canada. And then Wheeler had put me up for a Miller Fellowship at Berkeley, which started the year after I was in in, uh, in Birkbeck. And so I got them to, to split the difference, so I would go there half a year later. I was there already, and I realized that um, one could show that the two quantizations were different. And I did this you know, analyticity thing. This was in 73, I guess. Um, and Steve Full, I read, I'd written a letter to Steve Fulling and Fulling telling him about it. And he says he kept bugging me to publish it. And I finally published it in 76, because uh, I've always been slow to publish. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, as it turned out, clearly had a lot to do with uh, Hawking's thing. And the way I heard about Hawking stuff, I'd gone to, I was, I'd been going out with Pat, who's my wife, um, before we left, and I found every excuse to find a conference in England to go to. Uh, so, you know, I remember one time flying there, might have even have been, yeah, one time flying there, I bought a ticket, uh, I paid by check, and I had an account in the Bank of America, and somehow or other the check, I had enough money in my account, but the check bounced and it went the circuit five times. Well, once it had gone the circuit the fifth time, my account had run out of money. Uh, so this check finally got back as a bounce check, and I had to then go and scream at them, etc. At that time, as a postdoc, I could well afford, you know, and I didn't have many expenses, I could well afford to, you know, all of these trips were on my own account, but I could, but not if I had to pay them five times. Uh, but they finally gave me my money back after much argument. Um, and, so I had Don Page, and I had heard Don Page talking to Stephen Hawking, asking, and they were talking about that Hawking was worried about, you know, what is exactly the quantization around a black hole, etc. And he was just starting to work on that. 
and then Vince Moncrief, who was at Berkeley at the same time, um, he was working with uh, Taub in mathematics. I was sort of nominally with Ray Sachs, although he wasn't there for the first year. Uh, he was on sabbatical. Somebody had sent Taub a copy, uh, Hawking had sent Taub a preprint of his paper, and Taub showed it to Moncrief, and Moncrief showed it to me. Uh, so that was how I got to hear about what Stephen Hawking had done. And there was a conference on, I think it was in February, at uh, Harwell, which is the first place where Stephen talked about it in a conference. And I went to that and I was talking to Dennis Shelma, whom I had known from when I was Rogers postdoc. And, he's, and I showed him my paper, this was the paper on quantization in uh, a rotating black hole, uh, of neutrinos in a rotating black hole. And uh, he said, oh, well, you know, I can give you, you know, 10 minutes to talk about this in the conference. And instead I decided to talk about uh, sort of alternative quantizations in a black hole and I was still very confused and so my talk was incomprehensible I think to everybody including me um, but I remember it it really annoyed Jane um, during the conference uh, Taylor was it John Taylor at King's College and Paul Davies had both given talks, which were uh, very critical of Hawking's, of Hawking's stuff. And I sort of said, look, there are two different quantizations you could have of in around the black hole. You know, one basically is the killing vector along the horizon, and the other one is the affine parameter along the horizon, which correspond in the flat space case to the Minkowski quantization in the latter case and Rindler quantization in the first place case. And so I was confused as to which of these two quantizations one should really use and so forth. But as I said, it was a sufficiently incomprehensible talk that I think nobody understood what I was saying. But I remember at lunch that day, I was sitting just across from Jane and, and Stephen and Jane lit, really lit into me because she felt I was criticizing Stephen, uh, which I wasn't. I was just totally and utterly confused. <laughs> uh, so was it, was it this confusion that then led you to work on what eventually has become known as the Unruh effect or acceleration radiation, as I know? Well, that, that was really, the, you know, the letter that I'd written to Stephen was really, in many ways, already that. I mean, all of the fundamental mathematics was already in that letter. Uh, and then I was, when Hawking's paper came out, I was really confused where those these particles being created. And it was clear that one couldn't use the sort of global definitions of particles that, for example, Parker had used. Parker and Fulling had used in cosmologies which were, you know, Fourier modes over all of space. That's uh, asking where, you can't use a Fourier mode to ask any question about where. Uh, and so I was trying to think about, you know, how in the world one could answer that question. And that led to this, this idea of introducing a particle detector which was at least localized at one place. It wasn't localized in time, but it was localized in one place. And in this case, one could, one could think about that detector staying at a fixed radius as, a, you know, the radius being a place, and since the thing is time independent, in order to try and answer that question. And so that was where, so I wrote up all of this stuff in the notes on black hole evaporation which should have been really at least three different papers. You know, one was sort of an analysis of what Hawking had done. 
One was this accelerated detector business, and one was a quantization of a scalar field in a spherically symmetric space-time. Um, so spherically symmetric modes of a scalar field in a spherically symmetric space-time, which Berger, Chitra, Moncrief, and a fourth person had worked on. Um, and they had run into trouble, and I, I, I sort of fixed up that trouble in the last section of my paper. So it really should have been four papers instead of, or three papers instead of one, piling this all into one paper. But I was too lazy to write four papers. <laughs>